are listening to Rootbound, a podcast about plants for when you're stuck inside. What's this on my plate? Why, it's parsley! This week's Rootbound sponsor. Once relegated to the corner of the plate, but no longer. Parsley, more than a garnish. Hey, what's up? Thanks for listening to Rootbound, episode number 58. I'm your host, and my name is Steve. Rootbound is the podcast about plants for when you're stuck inside, and each week, I invite a guest who joins me on the podcast to share with us all about a plant that means something to them, and then I share with a guest about a plant that means something to me. And through this process, we all can learn more about plants and learn more about each other. So talking to the guest this week, who you're going to hear from in a moment, I learned about a guy named John Bartram. Have you ever heard of John Bartram? If you're from Philadelphia, you probably have, but maybe maybe you haven't, unless you're like really into plants, which maybe you are because you listen to this podcast. But anyway, I had never heard of John Bartram before, but the plant that our guest is going to share with us is very closely connected with this guy, John Bartram. And so I had to do some research to learn a little bit more about him. You're going to hear some stuff about him in the episode, but here's a few more details about John Bartram. John Bartram was an American botanist and horticulturist. He was born in 1699, and he died in 1777. So, like, really kind of an interesting period of time where, like, you know, uh, this this kind of, like, crossover between, uh, you know, British uh, colonies and, you know, right after 1776. You know, very interesting time to be alive. Um, but he was a botanist and horticulturist. He is regarded as starting the first botanic garden in the United States, which is called Bartram's Garden, and it still exists today, which is pretty cool. Uh, as you'll hear in the episode. And then according to Wikipedia, Carl Linnaeus, you remember Carl Linnaeus, he's like the guy when it comes to botany. He invented binomial nomenclature, you know, those like Latin names, he invented that. Well, Carl Linnaeus said that John Bartram was the greatest natural botanist in the world. So that's some high praise coming from Carl Linnaeus about John Bartram. And then one last little fun fact about John Bartram, and I found this uh, picture of a sign that's on the property of Bartram's garden that explains this concept. So I'm going to read that to you. It's about this concept of Bartram boxes. And so this is the quote from the sign. It says, Every autumn, Bartram's seed boxes were shipped to London merchant Peter Collinson for distribution throughout Britain. Bartram's clients included gardeners and nurserymen, titled nobility, and professional scientists. His seed list was advertised in the Gentleman's Magazine, and Bartram's plants went to the Chelsea Physic Garden, Kew Gardens, and King George I. The boxes would contain up to 100 or more varieties of seeds and sometimes dried specimens and natural history curiosities. Live specimens were more difficult to transport and were saved for special occasions. So he kind of had like a really early version of like today's modern subscription boxes, you know, where you, like, sign up to get, like, you know, tea or, I don't know, cheeses or, like, jam of the month or something like that. But the Bartram boxes was, like, this thing every year he would send out these boxes full of seeds. And uh, and a lot of the American plants that are in Europe today are because of John Bartram, which is very, very interesting. And free idea for those folks who run the modern-day Bartram's Garden, start a new Bartram's Box subscription service. I bet you that would do pretty well. The correspondence between Bartram and Peter Collinson, the wool merchant of London, continued for 35 years. Collinson saw a great opportunity for people in Europe to learn about the plant life of the American wilderness. Botanists and naturalists in England, Sweden, and Holland received many shipments from Bartram and sent him samples of rare things in exchange. Hello, Andrew. Welcome to Rootbound. Thanks for having me. Do you have a plant to share with us today? I do. I'd like to share uh, Franklinia alatamaha, the Franklin tree. Okay, so I, I when I, I got this in the email earlier, and I I, I um, held off on googling it because I didn't know the name right away. So I'm going to Google it now while you start to tell me why you chose it. Why is it meaningful to you? Sure. So um, I, I work at the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, which is. Uh, nearly a 200 year old organization in Philadelphia. And this is probably the most iconic tree to Philadelphia. So um, 
John Bartram was one of the uh, earliest gardeners, horticulturists, and introducer of plants uh, in the United States. Uh, Bartram's Garden, which sits on the banks of the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia, was the first or is the first uh, botanic garden in the United States. And he kind of built his collection mostly from collecting plants from uh, the wild or collecting seed from the wild and then growing them on. And one of the ones that he collected in uh, 1770 is the Franklin tree, uh, Franklinia alatamaha. And he found it on the uh, Altamaha River. So the, the species name is a little corruption of that name. So the actual river mm-hmm. is Altamaha. The epithet is Alatamaha, so just a little uh, quirk there. So he found this tree, uh, and uh, they collected seeds and brought them back to Philadelphia and grew grew them on. They went back in the late uh, 1700s and couldn't find it again. There's one spotting, supposedly, of it in 1803, but after that, it's become extinct, in the wild. Oh. So the only plants that exist are those in private collections and in botanic gardens. So it's a native tree to this very, you know, dis- distinct area of Georgia along the Altamaha River. It is, I would say, relatively widely in cultivation today. Uh, you can grow it in zones five through eight. So uh, I would say from, say, Boston, you know, all the way down to Georgia and probably uh, west, you know, into Ohio, you know, may- maybe Chicago with protection. And then you could definitely grow it on, on the West Coast or the Pacific Northwest. And it's a small tree. It uh, gets about 30 feet tall at maturity, although the, the champion, the biggest one, supposedly in cultivation is around 45 feet tall. It can be single trunked or multi-trunked. In cultivation, it actually does better in more northern climates than from where it's native to in in Georgia. It has kind of strap-like leaves that are glossy green, and then in the fall turn, can turn a purplish red or to red. I've seen fall color on Franklinia where it's a fire engine red. And then it blooms late in the summer. So it's one of the the few summer flowering trees. You know, most trees flower typically in, in the spring. This tends to bloom in August. And it has come an open face, a five-petaled white flower. And then the center of the flower is the collection of the, the male reproductive parts, the stamens. And they're golden, so you have this white flower with kind of a, a golden center, almost, almost like an like an egg. Let me just jump back in sure. here real quick because you said so many fascinating things <laughs> here, I, I, and and the most fascinating to me is this is this fact that the the tree was you know uh, found by uh, you said by like who 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 did you say again? Uh, Bartram, uh, John, John Bartram. He found this tree, he took the seeds, he brought it back home with him, and then the next time he went to look, it was extinct. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And which, so which, yeah. what what a great kind of story of, of, of like conservation and like luck almost, right? Yeah, to- totally. It's uh, uh, There is a lot of kind of mystery around e- even the initial discovery. So the fact that they found this plant, which probably was really on the brink of of extinction when they found it, you know, I mean, there's not enough uh, good documentation on, you know, how many trees were there? Uh, You know, was it a bit a forest of these trees or did they find one, you know, how did they find, how did they find it in the first place? I mean, we're talking about exploration on, on horses and uh, you know, so the fact that they found it, it is somewhat, uh, mysterious, almost like finding a needle in the haystack. And then they went yeah. back and obviously, you know, they had no benefit of GPS in 1770. So, uh-huh. you know, they might just not have been able to find it. There's been searches since and, you know, they found nothing. And, and it, it could have been something that was just super rare to begin with. 
and they did just find kind of the last vestiges of it. Luckily, they got seed. You know, they could have yeah. easily gone there and not not got seed. Wrong time of year and like totally missed yeah. it. Oh man, yeah. what a so, what a like a lucky thing. So they brought it back, and you figure seventeen seventy. That's a t- you know propagation was not very sophisticated then. So even growing mm-hmm. anything from seed or cuttings would have been uh, a challenge. But they got it to grow. You know, and then let's say for the next, you know, at least 150 years, it was probably only growing at Bartram's garden. So it went from kind of their home garden to kind of morph, ultimately morphing into a botanic garden. And then I think people started taking cuttings from it and seeds from that plant or plants at, at Bartram's. And there was this interesting study that was done in 1999 where they tried to get a, um, a leaf sample globally of all the Franklinias they could find either in private gardens or in botanic gardens in Arboreta to do a, a DNA study. What So what they wanted to um, find out is, are all the plants that are in cultivation, do they come from the, the, the Bartram's Franklinia or perhaps there were other collections. Oh done, yeah, done. Like maybe somebody else found it exactly. that we didn't know about, and so yeah, that's really cool that uh, so they like test- DNA technology yes. can like enable that kind of study. Yeah, so they tested two thousand forty six plants, wow. and what what they ascertained is that they did in fact all come from that Bartram's original wow. collection. So chances are. It's not to say it couldn't have been collected, but you're talking about a long, you know, a long, uh, yeah. a long period of time. Um, so, you know, today, uh, they're, yeah, I won't say they're, they're not, by no means ubiquitous in American gardens. They're, they're definitely around. They are um, a little fickle in, in, the uh-huh. set, in the sense that, they don't transplant well. Like if you're going to grow mm. a Franklinia, you probably want to get a plant that's relatively young, probably in a small container, like a, a gallon size or smaller, and plant it as a young tree and then don't transplant it. It doesn't have a real fibrous mm. root system. So that probably uh, adds to its difficulty transplanting. Uh, it's thought to be maybe susceptible to a root borne fungus that hits a lot of plants, especially rhododendrons called Phytophthora. Um, there could be some other other quirky kind of mycorrhizal issues going on that we just can't, can't see. Uh, it's thought that uh, it may be susceptible to some of the same diseases that cotton gets. So that's why oh, okay. perhaps oh. it hasn't thrived in the South, even though it's from uh, the South. Uh, it should have heat tolerance embedded in its genetics being from uh, the south. Um, so, yeah, it's, a, may, may, it's perhaps not as widespread in cultivation as it might be just due to uh, some of these slight cultural issues. But that's that's not reason enough not to to uh, grow it because I've seen plants uh, you know, they're say 30 years old or less and they're, they're very vigorous. I was looking at some just the other day that I know were planted from seed and, uh, about 30 years ago and they're multi-stem trees, probably 20 feet tall, 25 oh, wow. feet wide. And when they're covered in flower, they're quite, uh, spectacular. And then the fall color is also very notable. Wow. This, this is really amazing. I mean, uh, one other, I mean, how many... How many things of luck did we have to get that this become, can become such a treasured ornamental tree, right? They had to find it. They had yeah. to get the seeds back. They had to grow the seeds. The tree had to survive in the climate that, w- that they were growing it in, right? They could have easily taken it back, and, and it could have been not a tree that can overwinter very well, right? Exactly. From Georgia. You figure yeah, winters and- in 1770 were probably a lot harsher than they are yeah. today, so it had to survive all of that yeah wow and then and then you get i'm looking at pictures now it is a really stunning flower and 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 from my like uh you know estimation that there's not many there's not many like 
trees that you see that have that kind of flower, particularly like you said in in like that big of a flower in summer. Yeah. Right? I think of like crepe myrtles, you get a lot of flowers in sure. summer. But that's a that's not this big showy like egg yolk flower like you're saying. And so wow, what how lucky we are that that happened. And 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 it makes you think of also how many how many plants like that that we just never even saw. Right? Exactly. No. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there's you know countless you know, probably hundreds of plants that also were on the brink of extinction that didn't get discovered and are now truly extinct. Uh, This is obviously extinct in the wild, but it's not truly extinct. And that, that is a, that is a big uh, distinction. You know, what would be interesting, which I don't think to my knowledge has happened is for somebody to find fossilized records oh, yeah. of this plant so if they fi- found it fossilized and if they found it you know in other locations of the country or even the world then then they would know that you know at one time perhaps the the geographic range of this was much more significant you know they found fossils of uh, of a tree that looks like what we think of ginkgo today uh, they've mm-hmm. identified it as a different species but they found it in Idaho, you know, when, oh, I, when wow. I think uh-huh. of ginkgo, I don't think of Idaho, you know, yeah, gin- right. ginkgo is native to China. It can be grown globally, probably maybe in Idaho, pro- maybe, maybe not in Idaho. So, you know, if you look at, you know, uh, you know, it's just at, uh, it, in Washington, DC, and there's this great, um, uh, exhibit on, on ev- evolution and it shows kind of the the, you know, the maps of the forests of the United States and you know there was these incredible kind of subtropical forests that you know reached all the way up into the northern United States and you know hence these kind of fossilized records so you know what was here millions and millions of years ago doesn't often reflect what's here today interesting um I have I have one more question, then maybe you have some other stuff we missed. But my last question about it is: What is the fruit like? How does it How right. is it fruit? How does it have a seed? What What's that like? Yeah, so the fruit is a, a five parted kind of woody round capsule. So it it set, sets the seed uh, after flowering, and uh, in that kind of round seed pod, there's. I would say dozens of little black mm. seeds. And it's quite possible that when uh, the, the Bartrams discovered this is even if they had gone not in the fall, when people do typical seed collecting, it could have been, they could have gone another time of the year where these, these capsules were still on the plant. Oh, interesting. you know, cause it does, uh, they will hold them on there for, quite some time. It's not like an apple tree that once the apples ripe, they start falling off the tree. Uh Uh, These can actually be held on the tree for, for months, if not, if not longer. Uh, And that if somebody is doing kind of home propagation, probably the easiest way to grow Franklin is from seed. Um, And then you can also do it from, from cuttings, although it is a little bit more difficult. Very interesting. Um, and then I guess this is maybe leading from the seeds. How how are like the what's the seed spreading mechanism? And like thinking like what animals initially spread it, or maybe is that one reason why it was not so widespread? Is it missing right. the yeah. vector for spreading? Yeah, yeah. I think we don't know. I'm gonna guess. It, I'm gonna guess it was a could have been a squirrel. You know, squirrel kind mm-hmm. of grabbing those and kind of breaking them open. Uh, mm-hmm. Could have been a, a bird of some sort mm-hmm. kind of pe- pecking on it. But yeah, it may have been that. Who knows? Maybe the the animal that that ate these, or maybe even co-evolved with the Franklinia, became extinct before the Franklinia, and that aided in it not getting disseminated and spread around. You know, you we, yeah you know, yeah. There, there's probably lots of theories on on what really happened to it. You know, you would think that for it to actually become a species. Uh, there would have been a larger population at some point. Um, but maybe it, it remi- maybe this was a plant that was popular 
10 million years ago and it was <laughs> it had been in decline for the last 5 million and the 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 very last one was found in 1770 or maybe there yeah. was there could have been a cat, cataclysmic event in that area like uh, a forest fire you know that just mm-hmm. wiped them all it could have been a flood could have been could have uh, been i mean interesting thing to think about if you know i don't know uh how cotton cultivation was starting if there was a disease that was that was spread by other it, yes. environmental factors yes. right i think that's um, been theorized as well interesting uh the other thing I think is interesting, it reminds me a little bit of, um, you know, one of my favorite plants I've talked about on the show is pawpaws. And, and they, they, they surmise that those, the vector for those was giant sloths, which went extinct. Right. But luckily, humans came around around the same time and the humans <laughs> helped the propagation. Um, but if you're not lucky enough to create a fruit that humans like then, and, you're, and your vector animal it goes extinct, that's, yeah. that's tough. And right. so luckily, humans came around and decided – we also like pretty plants too, not just uh, right. not just edible ones. And so, interesting, interesting. And, and that's actually where, you know, actually the story of the Franklinia is kind of continues because it um, a hybridizer, uh, Tom Rainey. He's works for North. He's a scientist with North Carolina State University, but he works out of a uh, a station in Western North Carolina. More. Uh, close or closer to Asheville. And what he did is he took Franklinia and hybridized it with Gordonia. So the, mm. the, the Loblolly Bay. And it's, it's not common to be able to take two different genera and, uh-huh. and cross them together. It, it is common to cross different species, mm-hmm. but there is no other species um, a Frank Linnea. So what he tried to do is he took, he, he looked at the DNA and, and, um, uh, surmised that Gordonia is close enough to Frank Linnea and crossed the two and created what is called a, a bi-generic hybrid. So it's a cross Whoa. between two different genus. They have to be in the same family and they have to be, um, uh, related uh, in, uh-huh. in their related enough in, in their DNA. So that hybrid is called Gord, Gordlinia. And uh-huh. so it's kind of wow. Gordonia and Franklinia put together. And um, uh, Gord, uh, Gordlinia, I think it's Latifolia. And uh, he's created actually a cultivar called Sweet Tea. So that's a good, good Southern uh, cultivar name. Uh-huh. And, wow. uh huh. And, it, what's interesting about it is it's intermediate between the parents. So Gordonia is evergreen. Franklinia is deciduous. Uh, Gordlinia in the South is fully evergreen. Even so I, I live in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, which is just South of Philadelphia. And in milder winters, it's, I would say almost fully evergreen for us, but it still gets, what's interesting. It's evergreen but still gets the fall color. So it's, uh, it's almost like it's quasi evergreen. So it's evergreen for most of the winter still loses its leaves, still gets the fall color. So you still get the evergreen aspect. You still get the fall color. You still get the, the flowers are very much like uh, Frank Linnea, but because it's a hybrid and and like many hybrids, it has what's called hybrid vigor. So it's more vigorous Mm. than uh, Franklinia. It doesn't seem to be fickle like Franklinia. So it had, you know, it's kind of a stronger, more robust plant. Uh, Again, it's not, I would say, uh, popular in the trade, but I think it's something that people should look for. Uh, You know, sometimes this goes under the uh, Gordlinia uh, or Gordlinia sweet tea. So something to keep your eyes out for. Think of the patience of a man like Bartram, knowing all the time that he couldn't possibly live long enough to see the full fruition of his labor. <laughs> that would not be a career suitable to an impetuous man like our Secretary of the Treasury. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the world has need of both such men, and our countrymen will enjoy the fruits of Bartram's labor. Even as we eat and enjoy these pearls. Exactly.
Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much for sharing Frank Linnea with me. That is like a super fascinating story that I had never heard before, and I'm glad to be able to share that with the audience. Do you mind if I share a plant with you? Sure. Great. So you're quite a plant expert, so I, I'm happy that if you have anything to say about this plant, please jump in. Uh, I'm definitely like a beginner here, but I did try to like go to the other side of the planet to pick a plant that maybe I have some surprising facts to tell you, but maybe not. Um, and the reason why this plant is 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 uh, meaningful to me is a number of years ago, my wife and I were lucky enough to travel to New Zealand, and there was a lot of plants there that made an impression on me. And uh, I probably will start peppering those in throughout the podcast because um, such a, such different plant life there than when you're used to living in North America, right? It's it's about as far away as you can get. Different hemisphere, uh, an island, so it's got all that island stuff going on, and and just I mean, just a f- super amazing to see all those plants. Um, but the plant I chose, uh, I, I first kind of like saw that it was a thing. We were on the southern island, and and they were uh, a tour guide was mentioning that the all the forests we were seeing around us were beech forests. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Beech, I, I know a little bit about a beech. I've been in beech forests in Europe, and I was like, oh, that's super cool. Um, and then another point, I was we were there in the summer, right? So because um, it was like Christmas time, and uh, uh, and I. Uh, I asked the tour guide, well, it must in the fall, it must look really amazing when all these change color because that's what beach does. And he was like, no, they, they don't. And I was like, what? <laughs> they're, they're evergreen. And I was like, that's really strange. And so then after I did some research, I, I've come to understand that they are called beach, but they are very different from the beach we know, right? They are not the same genus. Um, so so as you know, beach, uh, the beach we know in North America and Europe is, is genus Fagus, Fagus, uh, this is the Nothophagus, which is, this is my first fun fact in detail. The genus is Nothophagus. Actually, the family is Nothophagus. I'll get to that in a second. Um, Notho means false, so it's false beach. But there is some talk that, uh, that there was a mistake or someone mistranscribed Notho with a TH from Notto, which means southern beach. Because they're referred to as the southern beaches. They grow actually all throughout the southern hemisphere. Um, but the genus name is false beach. Um, which is maybe not fair to them, right? <laughs> anyway, so that's my plant. I don't know if you have any uh, any uh, knowledge or thoughts about Southern Beach. Yeah, I've I actually had the opportunity in from ninety, kind of end of ninety into early ninety one. I worked in New Zealand for three oh, months. Wow. I, I worked on the North Island, uh, but towards the end of the trip, I, I spent two or three weeks on the South Island. And then I've been back another time and then another time. So I've been there three times. And uh, that's probably also... I picked the plant that you... I I, I tried to go as far away as possible, but yeah, you still got me. (laughs) Uh, But it probably is the first place that I saw Nothophagus. I've seen it since then in, you know, botanical collections. Like if you tried to grow Nothophagus... In the U.S., probably your your best bet is going to be uh, the West Coast. You could right, probably right. grow it in like San Francisco. You know, you have to you know think of what the climate of uh, the South Island of New Zealand is like. Even though it's south, it's Southern Hemisphere, so everything's opposite. Yeah. So, as well, that go- <laughs> that's interesting because they grow. There's a big grove of. Um, of uh, redwoods in New Zealand right. that they tried to grow. Yes. So they're California redwoods because of that same principle. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, Nothophagus is, is like you said, related to our native Fagus, which is Fagus grandifolia, which is an East Coast species. And then, as you also mentioned, the European Fagus, European beach Fagus uh, sylvatica. But the Nothophagus has very tiny leaves by, yeah. by comparison. And, they're uh, really little, uh, I, 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 and like, so when I, we finally got to go into, I was looking at it from the distance, and it's a little bit hard to tell what the leaves look like that far, but when I was finally in a forest and looking at the ground, it's like this kind of almost a little bit bigger than confetti all over the ground, right? It, very beautiful, because they they don't turn all at once, but as they turn and fall, the ground gets littered with these uh, miniature colored leaves. Very interesting. Right, and like you said, it's, it's evergreen, and like in New Zealand... Almost the entire canopy, almost everything that's a tree or shrub is evergreen. So like oh, in our forests, the only things that in the northeastern forest, the only things that are evergreen are uh, conifers. 
And there are a lot of interesting endemic conifers also uh, to New Zealand, but not, yeah. you know, we're used to like firs and spruces and pines and most of the, uh, the evergreens native to New Zealand are in a family called Podocarpaceae, which mm. uh, I don't even think is, there's any found nat- natively in, in the United States. In any case, uh, you know, most, mostly evergreen. So if you walk through any of the forests of New Zealand, one, you're going to see plants you've never seen anywhere mm-hmm. before because it's, I would say, New Zealand and Madagascar, to me, have the most unique plants in, in, in the world. Yeah. And Nothophagus yeah. just kind of adds to that uh, kind of breadth of, of native plants. And like you said, because it's it's an island nation, and you know New Zealand's not close to really anything. It's I think twelve mm-hmm, mm-hmm. twelve hundred miles from Australia. People think I know. that Australia <laughs> and New Zealand <laughs> yeah. are next to each other, but it's like going from you know from Philadelphia to you know probably Nebraska. You know that, yeah, that much yeah. distance before you hit hit one or the other. There are you know islands off of New Zealand. There's one, one called the Chatham Island. Oh which, yeah. Which has, um, a, a flora that's even more unusual than kind of mainland, uh, New Zealand. So, uh, yeah, I think Nothophagus is a great, uh, uh, a g- plant that people should know, you know, they probably can't cultivate it in most parts of, of the U S cause it really needs kind of a, a cool, uh, you know, slightly humid uh, situation like uh, San Francisco, you know, probably Seattle, may- maybe, maybe Vancouver. Yeah. I, I and, and then I guess if you want to see them and you don't want to go all the way to New Zealand, I guess there are Nothophagus genuses in our, our species in uh, South America. Yeah, as Chile, well, Chile I think Chile, like, yeah. Yeah. you know, if you, if you look you think at about that, exactly. Band. I think they're, I don't know the exact range, but I think it is like Southern South, South America. I'm not sure if there's any in native in Australia or not. There may be others. I think there is. Yes. I think there are some of those other islands like New Caledonia and places like that. Maybe. All right. So here's my fun fact. And maybe, you know, know this part. Um, uh, So apparently relatively recently, and I think it's one of maybe it's not even like fixed yet. Cause it, when you Google it, it's a little bit confusing, but I believe Nothophagus has actually been split into five new genuses. Oh, wow. what so a- in, in, um, New Zealand, it's Fuscopora and Lophazonia. So silver beach is the sole Lophazonia. And then the other four Southern beaches are Fuscopora. And it used to be Nothophagus subgenus Fuscopora. But I think that do, through doing DNA studies, they have decided that that these five are are, are 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 maybe four. I don't know, but I just know in New Zealand there's two distinct genuses, Fuscopora and Lophazonia, and that's relatively new. Um, and I think it makes sense because you know the name Nothophagus came from some European guys going down there and going, going this reminds me of beach. Yeah, okay, these are right. all beach, but once you start really analyzing them, I think you're probably like, oh yes, these are pretty different. Uh, you know, they're related. They're still in the same. So the, the Nothophagaceae or Phagaceae, I always pronounce right. that wrong, is the family still. And there is a Nothophagus genus still, but there are four other s- genuses yeah. that okay. used to be under that, which is right. pretty interesting. interesting. And, and like I said, it's one of those things I'm not sure whether that's been fully adopted yet. I think it might still be in process or <laughs> that 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 uh, those naming conventions and how that happens is quite confusing. And I think quite a, a long can be a long process to get it really like settled yeah and it's there's no one international authority you know oftentimes how you know kind of the splitting apart of a genus or you know or you know creating different species that often happens you know as a a, a part of somebody's research often a um, you know a phd thesis and then it, you know, it has to be reviewed and often gets reviewed in, you know, international uh, taxonomy forums or magazines like Taxon. So, you know, it has to, it kind of gets, you know, if it gets generally approved by the top scientists, maybe in that, in that, 
that group, then it often gets adopted by the top botanic gardens. So, Mm -hmm. you know, places like Missouri Botanic Garden, Royal Botanic Gardens Q, uh, Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh, Wisley Gardens, uh, you know, if they start adopting the name, then you know that it's probably fairly uh, uh, solid. Yeah. It seems like, you know, the, the references now for the different uh, genuses are mostly in the New Zealand-like botanical scene, so maybe it hasn't really filtered out right. there yet. Sure. But I guess there's been some papers about it. And then the last thing to close on, which has a little bit of a link to your story with Frank Linnea and it having to do with conservation, uh, the really interesting thing about the beaches in New Zealand is um, the biggest uh, intact forest systems in New Zealand are beach forests. And that's because the beach in New Zealand grows higher up in mountainous regions where, where it's a little bit different than we're thinking of the, the conifers in New Zealand grew in more lower land yep. stuff and mixed forests with the beaches too. But the, the pure beach forests are in the mountains. Um, and then, you know, as colonization happened in New Zealand, many of those lower land things were, were logged and then turned into agricultural land. Um, but the, the beaches were preserved just because it was harder to cut the wood. I mean, it's good wood, but they, they were just hard to get to. And now there's very strong conservation laws in New Zealand, um, which has left these really amazing, amazing beach forests intact. Um, but the, the thing that I found interesting is that, uh, New Zealand does have very now strict logging laws for native species. So you mentioned some of those conifers, which there's one called Rimu and one called, uh, Kauri, which are really amazing woods, but, um, the majority of those forests and the, and the silver beach and the beach forests are on conservation lands now. Um, but even if you have some of those woods on private land, there's very strict laws for how it can be cut. So you can, but it's like very regulated and it can only be cut in registered sawmills. And so a way to, to you know, protect these very special trees um, that really grow nowhere, nowhere else in the world. Yeah. Cause you figure, especially on, on the North Island and any land that you see today, that is covered with sheep, which is, you know, most of New Zealand would have been, yeah. would have been forested. Um, so, yeah. So you're right. You know, these little pockets that are left are, you know, really important because that floor is not represented, you know, mostly anywhere else in, in, in the world. So, you know, preservation is, is paramount in, in New Zealand, probably maybe even more so than most any other co- country has, you know, really restrictive uh, rules on, you know, what you can bring into the country. Like Mm -hmm. it's almost impossible Mm -hmm. now to bring foreign plants into, into New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, well, actually maybe one last little fact then that reminds me, because, you know, the, one of the big problems in New Zealand is invasive species and particularly invasive mammals yeah. right because there is no native mammal to the only native land mammal in in new zealand is a bat yeah and then there's a few there's a few seals that you know are in the border uh but but because of that um north of vegas like the beech tree uh goes through these mast years where it produces a ton of seeds and the possums love those seeds and so it's a, when there's a mast year the control of the Australian possum, which is massively um, invasive in, in New Zealand, becomes a much bigger problem because they can eat a lot more. And and the the forests weren't really expecting the those little creatures to be such a hungry uh, for those little beech nuts. So yeah. yeah, they've been very aggressive in the control of any exotic mammals, da- even down to like mice and rats. I know there's some examples yeah. of islands you know, off of the coast of New Zealand where they've been able to eradicate, you know, down to a mice or a rat. But when I was there, the Australian opossum was a real issue, not only just eating seed, but there's a a tree called the uh, uh, New Zealand Christmas tree. It's uh, a a metarocitorus excelsa. It has these kind of, um, kind of frilly uh, red flowers around Christmas and the yeah, Australian, I was there at the time and I saw that. Yeah. It's so beautiful. Yeah. The Australian opossum would climb out to the ends of the branches and eat the new growth. So it oh, kind yeah. of would stunt it and really kind of, uh, you know, restrict uh, the growth of the tree. So, you know, uh, the family I lived with were pretty uh, brazen, I would say, in their 
uh, anytime they saw a possum, they would go out of their way to, to try to get rid of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a big problem everywhere, but particularly those islands, that's an issue. Um, okay, the last thing for real is I just want to make sure I note the uh, indigenous name for the Silver Beach, at least, which is uh, Tauhai, I think. Pronunciation may be wrong, but uh, you know that's that's the name that it was called before someone confused it for beach, which is interesting. I'll make sure I clarify that. Um, before we go, um, I just want to make sure you get a chance to tell the audience a little bit about the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society. Sure. So the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society was started in 1827. Uh, Today, it's um, we really uh, have four kind of major impact priorities. So we really strive to create healthy living environments. Uh, We want to increase access to fresh food. Uh, We want to use horticulture to expand economic opportunity. And we really want to use um, horticulture as a way to connect people and make uh, meaningful social connections. And we do that through kind of uh, some major project groups. So we maintain about 80 acres of public gardens and landscapes, over 20 different uh, spaces uh, that we do often in times in partnership with other nonprofits throughout mostly Philadelphia. We have a large uh, street tree program where we plant about 1,500 uh, street trees, both in Philadelphia and in the region every year. We partner with 170 community gardens throughout the city. And part of that is them growing food for themselves, but also uh, we're very much about sharing, whether it's sharing knowledge, but also sharing produce as well. So excess produce goes to support local uh, food kitchens and food banks. Uh, One of the things people don't know about us is we also have a program to clean and green and maintain uh, vacant lots as open green spaces. So we clean and green about 500 a year. But in our portfolio, we have 13,000 vacant lots throughout Philadelphia that every two weeks somebody is mowing, weed whipping, cleaning the trash off. And for a lot of these parts of the city, it's where there's lots of other equity issues, including green equity issues. So Mm -hmm. uh, these uh, green spaces uh, also can become parks for these uh, parts of the city. Uh, We also have a workforce development program uh, where we're training people in in need of jobs and in need of uh, uh, skills, hireable skills. So we train them uh, to be gardeners and horticulturists. And then we have a great program with the Philadelphia Water Department uh, for stormwater management, where we're getting rain barrels and downspout planters and rain gardens and permeal pavers out to uh, residents. And we've done that uh, since 2014 for about 6,000 residents. And then one of the things that people know us most for is the Philadelphia Flower Show, uh, which has been running almost every year since 1829. Um, and it will happen again, uh, this spring. It always kind of kicks off. It's actually late winter, but it kicks off, uh, what we consider spring in the Philadelphia area. And that can get as many as 250,000 visitors over a a 10 day period. Wonderful. Well, it sounds like a cool organization. I feel like I definitely need to go up there. Um, shockingly, I've never really been to Philadelphia. I used to live in Pittsburgh, but I never, Uh, for some reason, never made it. That's That's like, yeah. That's almost, yeah, that's almost in Ohio. <laughs> it's a different place completely. But somehow I never like on the way over or whatever. I mean, I've been on a train through sure. and whatever. I need to get up there. I live in D.C. now. It's not that far. No, not uh, but far I need all. to go up there, visit, visit, and try to spot some uh, Franklinia trees. Yeah, please do. Come on up. Uh, be happy to show you around. We could go to Bartram's Garden, the, Wonderful. the kind of so-called birthplace of the Franklinia. Uh, but there's also, you know, this area has... Uh, the greatest concentration of botanic gardens and arboreta in the country. Uh, wow. We have 38 within a 50 mile radius of Philadelphia. Wow. Wow. Well, yeah, definitely got to make a, make a pilgrimage up there uh, for the podcast. So, well, thanks so much for joining me on this episode of Rootbound, Andrew. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. This evening, the cavalcade tells the story of one of the greatest natural botanists that ever lived, John Bartram. 
Bartram collected, cultivated, and crossbred plants and flowers, not merely for ornamental purposes, but to increase their usefulness to mankind. As an overture, Don Voorhees and the Cavalcade Orchestra play Cole Porter's melodic Old Fashioned Garden. What a fascinating conversation with Andrew about the Franklin tree and what a treasure it is that we still have the Franklin tree to enjoy. And it's one of those things that I had no clue about until I talked to our guest in this episode. But now it's something I'm going to really make an effort to go see and uh, just not take for granted that we still have that tree. And thinking about the Franklin tree made me think about what other plants out there are also extinct in the wild. So I was doing some Googling around and I was reminded about the International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, or IUCN, and this is an international organization that does a lot of really interesting stuff regarding conservation. But one of the things they do is maintain the IUCN Red List, and this is a list of threatened species of all families, so plants and animals and fungi, um, and different levels of threat. So for example, there's ones that are of least concern you know they're not having a problem you know i think pigeons are definitely in that category Uh, but then then there's things like near threatened vulnerable endangered critically endangered extinct in the wild like the franklin tree and then very sadly extinct and these are plants and animals that have gone extinct in our modern lifetime which is you know uh really something to think about um but i was really curious about that status of extinct in the wild like what other plants are out there that like the franklin tree are extinct in the wild but still exist in cultivation and the iucn red list lists 44 plant species that are extinct in the wild and there's a a number of interesting ones in there there's a a kind of mango called the uh, kalimantan mango there's a flower called the yellow fatu and then there's a lot of uh, plants called cycads cycads are really interesting i've only learned a little bit about them and Maybe we'll talk about cycads on a later episode, but a lot of cycads are extinct in the wild and also other classifications of threatened. They're quite a threatened species. But let's step one level up. So there are 44 plant species that IUCN lists as extinct in the wild, but one step up above that is critically endangered, and IUCN lists 5,336 plants. It's only plants. This also lists animals and fungi and all that stuff but 5,336 plants that are critically endangered and and on the edge of becoming extinct. And many of these, maybe we're not going to be so lucky like we were with the Franklin tree, right? The Franklin tree had all those different factors that came together to to make sure that it uh, could survive in the wild. And there's a lot of just wild plants that just really don't do well in cultivation. So um, I think that's why it's really important to uh, preserve nature, to respect nature, to think about how humanity is having an impact on nature. And these plants, you know, uh, can serve as a lesson uh, to us. And I think the Franklin tree is a great example of that. So I'm really happy that Andrew shared that plant with me. And I'm very much looking forward to going to Philadelphia someday soon and seeing one at Bartram's Garden. That would be very cool. So that's it for the episode. Thanks for listening. My guest on this episode of Rootbound was Andrew Bunting. Andrew is the Vice President of Horticulture at the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, which you can learn more about at phsonline.org. If you like the show and you want to help support it, you can go to rootboundpodcast.com support and learn all the ways you can support the show, including supporting the show on Patreon. Rootbound is hosted by Species of Least Concern, Steve Ellington. Music by Christian Kriegeskota. Fake ads by... David Lonnie. Rootbound is a podcast about plants for when you're stuck inside, but if you can go outside, head up to Philadelphia and check out a Franklin tree. I mean, how cool are they? Parsley, more than a garnish. More than a garnish. More than a garnish to me.